National Nine News. This is Nightline with Jim Whaley. Pauline Hanson poised to play kingmaker in the Queensland election. Jet fighter pilot killed in fiery crash. And the return of the Kosovo refugees who fell in love with Australia. Good evening. Queenslanders go to the polls tomorrow in what looks like being a very close election. Premier Peter Beattie has been tipped to win, but both sides admit the final result is likely to come down to preferences and the impact of one nation. Melanie Went has our report. Squeezing every moment out of the last day of campaigning, Queensland Premier Peter Beattie and opposition leader Rob Borbidge began their media blitz at dawn. I've got your key opponent. G'day, Rob. How are you? you? All the best tomorrow. Thank you very much. Okay. May the best man win. Okay. Premier. Rob Borbidge all but conceded early defeat. Labor's in front, and uh, Labor are most likely to win, particularly if there's a high One Nation vote. Doing her very best to make sure of that, Pauline Hanson spent the day in North Queensland campaigning by helicopter. You're all wondering, weren't you? <laughs> Preferences from the 39 One Nation candidates are likely to play a crucial role. That might not help the Liberals, expecting a thumping at the ballot box over the decision by its coalition partner, the Nationals, to swap One Nation preferences. The Liberal Party is the only party that has kept to its principles. We're the only party that's putting One Nation last. Tired and drawn after nearly four weeks on the road, the Premier arrived for the one-off leaders' debate with none of his trademark confidence. Those nerves grew while he waited with wife Heather, but disappeared when the two leaders greeted each other like old friends. We do get on reasonably well together. Outside all this, he's sane and rational and so am I. And whoever wins has to buy the other one lunch. <laughs> the opposition leader kicked off early with a stinging reminder of why there's an early election. It's being held early because of electoral dishonesty. Well, there was no cover-up from me. We cleaned them out. They went. He has acted when he's been sprung. Federal issues cropped up. John Howard said that there would not be an increase in petrol prices out of the GST. He misled the Australian people. But it's the One Nation wildcard that's frustrated both sides. But the reality is that the election campaign over the last few days uh, has been hijacked. Where are the police to protect the community? That, to me, is more important than Pauline Hanson or Peter Beattie or Rob Borbidge. In this election of uncertainties, the only safe bet is that one of the leaders will be bowing out. Both Peter Beattie and Rob Borbidge have said they'll resign if they lose tomorrow. There was no clear winner, an omen perhaps, of interesting times ahead. The fact that uh, a whole room of undecided voters were still undecided after the debate uh, would seem to suggest that we might have to do it all again or something. Melanie went for Nightline. The federal government is set to announce major changes within the next few weeks to the tax reporting obligations for small business. Faced with a barrage of criticism and the threat of an electoral backlash from the business sector, the Prime Minister and the Treasurer met with industry groups to discuss the government's plans to simplify the business activity statement. Most of the changes are expected to be in place before the end of the March quarter, but the Treasurer wasn't prepared to announce the details until he's confident all the problems have been ironed out. When you're administering a uh, tax system uh, with uh, a couple of million people in it, you've got to make sure that you announce with certitude. The changes are expected to include a shift to annual business returns for the GST and a significant reduction in paperwork for most small businesses. One of New Zealand's most experienced Air Force pilots has died in a fiery crash near the HMAS Albatross Naval Base in New South Wales. 37-year-old squadron leader Murray Nielsen was taking his Skyhawk through an aerobatic manoeuvre with two other jets this afternoon when his plane came down in thick bushland. The impact ignited a series of fires. The Skyhawks were training for an event in the Australian International Air Show being held at Victoria's Avalon Airfield. They're stationed at HMAS Albatross, just outside Nowra, where they conduct exercises with the Australian Navy. More than a year after fleeing their Victorian safe haven, an Albanian family has come out of hiding. And Dan, his wife and their four children, had escaped from the Bandiana Army base, terrified of being sent home. Today, they ended their life on the run in Canberra, offering to hand themselves over to immigration officials. The officials have failed to appear. The family left with an anxious wait for a decision on their future. 
Meanwhile, there was a tide of emotion at Melbourne Airport today when 20 Kosovo refugees made a jubilant return to Australia. Sent back to their war-torn homeland last year, they've become the first to be allowed back as permanent residents. After returning to a devastated homeland 10 months ago, for these ethnic Albanians, touching down in Melbourne is the end of a long emotional journey. Hello. Reunited with friends who helped them during their stay in Australia after fleeing the war-ravaged Balkans two years ago, the relief was clear. It's sad to leave family there, but still I'm, I'm, I feel happy that I came back here. The return is a small triumph for supporters who thought they might never see these people again. It's a sense of relief and joy uh, that they are here and they're safe and well. While a small number of Kosovars have already settled as Australian residents, this is the first group to return en masse. 25 more expected to arrive next week. That convoy to include a family missing from today's flight. The conflict has escalated there over the last few weeks and this family just couldn't safely make it to the plane. Resting at a nearby hotel before flying on to Tasmania, the Krasnik family is already feeling at home. <laughs> For Nasser and Namani Bega, returning to their host home, an orchard near Shepparton, means instant employment and realising a dream. Cheers. Mimi Kwa for Nightline. The South Australian government has called in some of Australia's top engineering experts to help deal with a leaking reservoir. The Snowy Mountains engineers want the reservoir drained so they can properly assess the damage and deterioration and how big a risk it poses. After a week of finger pointing between the Campbelltown Council, State Government and SA Water, steps have now been taken to address safety concerns at the reservoir. It'll be drained below the level of an erosion hole and the water pumped into the sewerage system. Burst pipes have added to the problems. That created some minor damage. Um, how far we have to go to get a full view of that damage, uh, we're not sure. So it may be two metres, it may be six metres. Uh, that will have to be a judgement on a day by day basis. Earlier this week, a leaked emergency service memo claimed the banks were severely weakened. It cited a report commissioned five months ago that described the potential danger to residents as extreme. While that report hasn't been publicly released, this month's assessment of the dam has. And one of its greatest concerns is how trees have dried out surrounding soil, possibly weakening the banks of the reservoir. The report also says the banks may not have been adequately compacted when the dam was built and could cause large cracks to appear. It will take some weeks to lower it to the appropriate level and then uh, the responsible authorities will deal with the issues from there. Adam Thompson for Nightline. The Sydney teenager who died after being crushed at the Big Day Out rock concert is to become one of the faces of a national organ donor campaign. Jessica Michaelix Corneas have given someone else the gift of sight, a generous and timely legacy now being used to encourage organ donations. At just 16, Jessica McCarlick was too young to die. But when she did, her family at least had one easy decision to make. She said to us, hey, once I get the license, I will have the donor inscription on it. How about you guys? So after her tragic death at last month's Big Day Out concert, the teenager's wish to donate her organs was granted. Her corneas now helping someone else to see. Somebody else's eyes are seeing through her eyes, so it's like an extension of her life. So we know that her spirit is above with us. The family's plea for others to donate comes at the start of National Organ Donor Week. A new television commercial will be launched next weekend. They can have Cole's brain. He's never used it. Speaking publicly for the first time since he received a kidney from his helicopter pilot, Kerry Packer has also asked others to give something even Australia's richest man couldn't buy. The gift you can give is beyond your comprehension. More than 2,000 organ recipients are on waiting lists around the country, but supplies are desperately low. Last year, only 194 donors were found. Their organs alone helped around 700 others. One donor can save many people's lives and help potentially nine or 10 other people. The problem is donors are hard to find, even if they've joined the donor registry or tick the box on their driver's license. In the end, it's up to the family to decide. At least discuss it. Floor Bitcoin for Nightline. After the break, the Australian invention to help planes steer clear of volcanic disaster 
and a civilian tells of his role in the Hawaii submarine tragedy. A 16-year-old boy has died after being shot at a Sydney bus stop. The main suspects, two youngsters in school uniform. The teenager was shot in the shoulder near Bankstown Railway Station this afternoon. He apparently suffered a heart attack after being hit. You know, 40, 15 year old kids you know, walking around with guns and that. Uh, it's just a tragic thing to happen around here. Police are hoping security camera footage will help identify the offenders. A 54 year old woman who murdered her sick husband and cut up his body has been jailed for life. Akiko Kitayama killed her husband Hamago at their Gold Coast unit in 1999. The 62-year-old victim, a retired member of the Yakuza crime syndicate, was suffering the effects of a stroke. Mrs. Kitayama strangled him, chopped up his body with an electric saw and put the remains in the garbage. Today she maintained her innocence but won't nominate Yakuza involvement. That would be pure speculation. As, as you, you saw in the courtroom, there's really no evidence, no concrete evidence at this point in time of that. Mrs. Kitayama is planning to appeal her life sentence. A cocktail of toxic fumes continues to hang over the Perth suburb of Bellevue after a massive blaze at a chemical recycling plant last night. The inferno provided a spectacular sky show for local residents. Dozens of homes were evacuated as drums turned into dangerous projectiles. They in turn sparked fires which destroyed 15 hectares of bushland as well as logs in an adjoining timber yard. The future in our skies is looking a little safer, with Melbourne scientists coming up with a world first system to help passenger jets steer clear of volcanic dust. Several jumbos have come close to disaster when all their engines failed after encounters with ash clouds. To the naked eye or on weather radar, deadly clouds of volcanic ash can look like rain. But within moments of entering an ash cloud, silicon and phosphorus dust melting in the hot engines can cause them all to fail together, with alarming and potentially catastrophic results. KLM relit two engines and landed safely, but suffered an $80 million repair bill. Similar incidents, such as the one involving a Melbourne-bound British Airways jumbo over Indonesia, prompted CSIRO scientists to invent the infrared ash detector. Normal cruising altitude for a jet, we think somewhere between 100 and 200 kilometres, which would give the pilot five minutes warning. International airlines report about 60 volcanic ash incidents a year, so the $100,000 ash detector is attracting huge interest. By the time the CSIRO has fully developed this technology to the point of commercial viability, it will have spent more than $2 million. But the ultimate rewards could make that seem a very cheap investment. With the opportunity to get about 500 instruments per year in the air, we look, we're looking at about a $50 million per annum market. Charles Slade for Nightline. The search continues for the bodies of nine people missing after a Japanese research vessel was sunk by an American submarine. The search for answers is also continuing down a disturbing path. Six days after the tragedy, civilian John Hall has told how he and another man were at the sub's controls. The embarrassment for America continues to grow daily as more is learned about the submarine disaster. These were the civilians returning to shore after the nuclear sub they were on for a joyride sliced through the Japanese fishing trawler. It was a sort of floating schoolroom for trainee fishermen. Five young students are among the nine now given up for dead. Two civilians, including John Hall, were working the controls with the skipper when the collision happened. I remember his words pretty vivid. He said, Jesus, what the hell was that? Even though the civilians actually worked the levers, the Navy says they were closely supervised. It was starting to come down, and you could feel the sensation of it, of it coming down. There was a very loud noise, and the entire submarine shuddered. Now President Bush is saying such joy rides by civilians will have to be reassessed. To make matters worse, Navy officers admitted today the only reason the sub made the dramatic rush to the surface was to impress and even entertain the civilians on board. Robert Penfold, reporting for Nightline.
politics have taken another of the odd turns, all too familiar in Israel, with the outgoing Prime Minister agreeing to join his rival's government. Ehud Barak is now tipped to become Defence Minister under hardliner Ariel Sharon, who defeated him in the recent election. Meanwhile, security forces are on heightened alert in the wake of this week's bus terror attack in Tel Aviv. In Jerusalem, police and army units have restricted access to the Temple Mount ahead of the Muslim Friday prayers. A group of Australian, British and New Zealand prisoners of war have made a journey through memories they wish they'd never experienced, returning to Changi Prison in Singapore for the opening of a new memorial. More than 100 POWs are buried in this cemetery alone, with feelings still bitter about their Japanese capitals. I, I can't forgive them until such times as they apologise for what they did. The memorial includes historical exhibits of those painful days. And an Australian author who made a publicity-seeking paraglide into the grounds of Buckingham Palace late last year has escaped punishment. Police have dropped all charges against 36-year-old Brett Delamar. charged me with um, attempted burglary of Buckingham Palace and that was never going to stick, so uh, just, I, don't, I think it was all just too hard. Delamar's daring mission to make a name for himself has certainly worked. At the time, he sparked a massive security alert and captured headlines around the world. Two months on, he has publishers interested in his first book. In a moment in sport, the golf at Huntingdale, AFL and Rugby League, and in Rugby Union, a look at Australia's Super 12 hopes and how it might determine the next Wallaby coach. Now to sport, and the Masters in Melbourne will resume tomorrow, minus one of the main draw cards. Spaniard Sergio Garcia, who's missed the cut. Queenslander Adam Scott was in great touch, though, shooting a 66 to reach 7-under and take the outright lead on the final hole. But Brad King and Peter Lonard are right on his tail, just one shot behind. Day two was a day of survival. Jared Mosley missed the cut, but it didn't matter. An eagle helps ease the pain. He's certainly looking down the barrel. Steve Webster, on the outer, wanted in for the weekend. Hello. Rod Pampling also had no need for the putter. This at the 17th. Street in the hole. It is. After yesterday's surprise 65, Victorian amateur Michael Cocking got bogged down and let it get the better of him. Aaron Badley showed more restraint, trapped not once but twice at the last. Oh dear. Sergio Garcia was in for another bad day and it started on the first. He didn't miss the gallery but did miss the cut. The unsuspecting spectator needed treatment. Even the players were the target of wayward tee shots. Anthony Painter was picked out. He carried on sporting a lump the size of a golf ball. It had Brett Ogle ducking for cover. Showing the young guns how it's done, a fleet of older ones like Brad King. And he did it with youthful exuberance. Also Roger Davis, but he admits shots like these are pretty rare these days. Coming back beautifully. I haven't held one of those for quite a while, which is, uh, you know, just fantastic. Sharing the lead around, King and Peter Lonard settled in at six under and watched as a pack tried to join them. Adam Scott thought he had the edge with Tiger Woods' old sticks. They got him among the mix, then in front, coming through late to take it. But with 60 plus inside eight shots, it's anyone's with two days to play. Leith Mulligan for Nightline. New South Wales has taken first innings points in the Pura Cup match against Tasmania at the SCG. The Blues responded to Tasmania's 369 with 530. Opener Greg Mayle scoring his maiden first-class century. Tasmania in their second innings, 33 without loss. A disappointing start to AFL's Ansett Cup competition for St Kilda. The Saints going down to Collingwood at Melbourne's Colonial Stadium. Collingwood held on to a commanding three-quarter time lead, running out eventual winners by 18 points. Rugby League's longest ever season gets underway at the weekend. There'll be plenty of interest in Sunday's clash between St George Illawarra and the Sharks, who are hoping winger Ronald Prince can deliver the goods just like he does during the week. He's the Prince on pedals, the Sharks winger who's on wheels at 5 a.m., delivering letters and parcels on his route to a fully-fledged first-grade career. The mailman, they call me, yeah. Ronald Prince gets his third premiership start on Sunday, and out Cronulla way, they'll be hoping the 22-year-old postman can always get away from his chasers. I had one dog chase me when I was on my push bike, and um, I went down this gutter and 
sort of took a stack and this dog's still running at me, so I sort of got up and <laughs> I'm running away from it, which is funny. Would have been funny to watch. David Peachy takes over the Sharks' captaincy, teammates adapting now that Andrew Eddinghausen's 18-year career is over. We've got to sort of move on from that and hopefully they did learn from him over the last couple of years they played under him. He's been saying he's going to come down and, uh, and gee us up and, and frame with us, but uh, there's been no sight of him yet. Russell Richardson will oppose Paul McGregor, who at 33 will play his first premiership game since the 99 season. Now I'm back and I'm really keen and, and you know, taking it as it's my first game again. After a shoulder injury, the four test veteran is on incentive payments, $5,000 a game. It makes me perform well and get myself on the park each week. While the Sharks are without Rogers, Miller and Lang, the Dragons are also under strength. No Brown, no Timmons, no Tracy, so uh, I think we're all in the same boat. And Brisbane opens its defence of the Premiership title in another derby game against North Queensland in Townsville. The Broncos say they're ready to impress, despite the departure of Thorne, Carroll, Campion and Kevin Walters. If you can't get fired up for a round one, you might as well not play the game. Charles Christian for Nightline. There are plenty of moves afoot in the coaching world of Australian Rugby Union. And the big question going into the new season centres on who will fill the shoes of Wallaby coach Rod McQueen. Just as crucial for rugby fans, can the men in charge of our Super 12 contenders finally lay hands on an honour which has so far slipped through Australian hands? Andrew McKinlay has our report. Australia was the first nation to win Rugby Union's World Cup twice in 1991. And again in 1999. Australia salutes Johnny Under coach Rod McQueen, the Wallabies are not only current world champions, the Bledisloe Cup and Tri-Nations Trophy are also in their war chest. Yet no Australian team has won the world's toughest provincial competition, the Super 12, pitting New South Wales, Queensland and the ACT against the best teams from New Zealand and South Africa. With his contract almost complete, Rod McQueen will quit as Wallaby coach at the end of this season. So how Australia's teams perform in the Super 12 will have a big bearing on who will be his successor. The ACT Brumbies made the Super 12 final in 1997 under then coach Rod McQueen. Last year they lost to Canterbury under the guidance of Eddie Jones. His success in recent seasons has most fans saying he will succeed McQueen as national coach. Just don't say that to Jones. I think it's very much a compliment to the Brumbies, uh, not so much as a compliment to myself. I think it shows that what we've been doing down here is a, as a collective group over the last three seasons that, that people are watching and, and looking at it and maybe saying that something down here is of a good standard. With a host of key wallabies such as George Gregan and Stephen Larkham, the Brumbies are again being tipped as Super 12 winners. But when it comes to making predictions about the Brumbies or himself, Jones is ever the diplomat. All we're worried about is coaching as well as we can now and whatever happens in the future will look after itself. While Jones may be heir apparent to Rob McQueen, one of McQueen's predecessors will coach New South Wales. Bob Dwyer coached the Wallabies to their first World Cup in 1991, but being in charge of the Waratahs could prove a tougher challenge. New South Wales has never made the Super 12 finals and Dwyer becomes the Waratahs' fourth coach in six years. It's a very big city, Sydney, and New South Wales is a very big state. And it's a very big media presence, and sometimes the media build up unfair expectations, and if they're not achieved, then, then the people that didn't achieve the media's expectations suffer. On a two-year contract, Dwyer's determined not to become a media victim, but hedges on how the Waratahs will go this year. Oh, I just think it's, a, it's like having a bet at Randwick, you know, like, might, might come up, might not. Uh, I, I'm looking to see how the horse will run, you know. I'm, that's what I'm after. Dwyer may be a big believer in horses for courses, so don't expect the new look Waratahs to play like the Wallabies of 10 years ago. Has the old dog got a few new tricks up his sleeve? Or something, something's bound to suggest itself. <laughs> if the Waratahs have an old dog at the helm, Queensland's coach is the new kid on the Super 12 block. The culture of Queensland rugby has been turned on its head and Mark McBain has big boots to fill. The former Wallaby hooker replaces John Connolly as coach. Known as Knuckles, Connolly coached Queensland for 13 years, boasting a career success rate of 80%.
but was unable to bring Reds fans a Super 12 title. Eased into Connolly's old job on last year's tour of Argentina, McBain admits he'll be nervous before the Reds' first match. I've been lucky because I went to Argentina and we had eight games over there. Um, and then the penny dropped that I was the Queensland coach over there. Uh, but, yeah, there's going to be some butterflies that night, for sure. The switch from rugby league to rugby union by Brisbane Bronco Wendell Saylor has attracted plenty of pre-season headlines, but he won't be eligible to play for the Reds until next season. It will be a different regime to Connolly's. McBain keen for Wallabies in the Red squad, such as John Eels and Daniel Herbert, to be part of the coaching process. They've been fantastic. They're, they're really eager to go well, and uh, they've wanted to change a lot of things, and, and we've allowed them to do that, which means that they get responsibility for it all. Among McBain's coaching staff are former Wallaby fullback Roger Gould and Ford's guru Alec Evans. While both are convinced the Reds can win the comp, their boss has more humble aspirations for now. We'd like to make the finals. Simple as that. Um, I know Roger's talked about make, winning the thing, and I think a lot of players want to do that. Um, but, I, I, you know, if we can make the finals, then who knows what happens from there. The Super 12 competition kicks off on Friday, the 23rd of February. Andrew McKinlay for Nightline. And still to come on Nightline, the latest finance and the weekend weather. The national weather and a trough extends across northern Australia with a tropical cyclone affecting the Gulf country. A high is moving across Tasmania and into the southeast of the continent. The forecasts, showers in Darwin and Brisbane, chance of showers in Sydney, Fine in Canberra, Melbourne, Hobart and Adelaide, and for Perth becoming fine early in the day. In finance news, the Australian share market ended the week lower, the all odds down five points. In Tokyo, the Nikkei fell 152 points. In London tonight, the FT100 is 57 points down in morning trading. Gold is fetching $256.80 US an ounce. And in European trading tonight, the Australian dollar is buying 52.81 US cents. 57.8 euro cents, 60.5 yen and 36.3 p. And that's the news this Friday night from all of us here at Nightline. Have a great weekend. Good night. <laughs>